Right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sally Frost, and I am your host for this morning. Welcome to the Chris Buckley Memorial Lecture and day two of the Postgraduate Research and Innovation Symposium for the College of AES. Uh, just a few Zoom housekeeping rules. I suggest you put your screen on speaker view 
which you can toggle to top right corner of your screen. Uh, before we begin the actual lecture, we have prepared a short memorial for Chris Buckley um, that we will play and then uh, our DVC Prof Modi will do the official welcome. So Becky, if you can start the video on Chris Buckley, please.
Thank you very much. Um, it's now my honor to hand over to our Deputy Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science, Professor Albert Modi, to welcome you officially to the lecture. Albert, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sally, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the leadership of the University of KwaZulu-Natal at all levels, starting with the council, the executive management that is led by our vice chancellor, Professor Nana Poku, the senate of this university. And I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of not, of not just the current leadership of engineering as a whole, I'm speaking on behalf of many decades of the leadership of engineering uh, since uh, Chris started working with this university. I'd like to welcome you all um, members of uh, WASH, the research group that uh, Chris dedicated his life to after establishing it, I dare say. Uh, many people who are now um, away from the University of KwaZulu-Natal and working who still remember Chris as a result of his impact. Um, the members of the family uh, of Chris who gave us this man for such a long time and we will forever be grateful to all of them. I don't know what words to use to thank the people who saw the vision of Chris. The people who turned their heads opened their eyes and listened to Chris with their ears when he identified a global problem and they supported this research through their funds. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation continues to be with us, the Water Research Commission and many other organizations that uh, believe in what Chris used to believe to, in. And I'd like to thank all of them. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Chris Buckley Memorial Lecture, the importance of transdisciplinary research for water and sanitation transformation. Someone is asking, what is transformation? You can say whatever you want. You can say it in many different ways. Chris was able to say it in many different ways as an engineer. He was able to talk to scientists in the laboratory, in the field, and anywhere else where they were talking in conferences and in the classrooms. But more so, Chris was able to talk to policymakers as well as the people who are affected by those policies. I remember being with him in the deep rural areas of Peter Marisbeck, an area called Vulingela, where we were pointing fingers at sludge and he told us that it's going to be turned into something useful. I can take you there now. I can touch that sludge and I can produce something that is called food. Thank you very much, Chris. I'm sure that uh, the people who advised this university to have a Chris Bartley Memorial Lecture will continue to support us and galvanize many people in the world as we are joined by people from all the continents today to listen to this special lecture, the first one. Thank you, um, leadership of uh, WASH for organizing this. Special thanks to Suzanne, who's been acting as a director since uh, Chris, uh, uh, Chris left us. I want to thank the people who are going to be giving you more details about Chris and especially about his work um, Neil, uh, Mr. Neil McLeod and Professor Kathy Sutherland. I'm not going to take too much of your time because I know you're going to hear much more about Chris. Thank you very much and welcome to the University of Kozulu Natal. Thank you very much, Prof Modi. Uh, without further ado, we will move over to the lecture. Our first speaker is Mr. Neil McLeod who is the former head of the Water and Sanitation at Etequini. He is a current member of the advisory board of the WASH R&D Center at UKZN, 
and a director and chair of the Board of Sanergy in Kenya. Mr. McLeod is also a sought after consultant on water and sanitation related issues nationally and internationally. And he was a very close colleague and friend of Chris. So Neil, over to you. Thanks, I'm just trying to get this thing to go full screen. And uh, Neil on the bottom, move over another icon, one more icon, that one, click on that one. Right. Okay, thanks. And thanks uh, Professor Modi for your introduction. So yeah, the, the topic of this talk, um, transdisciplinary research, the question obviously is, as, as Professor Modi said, what, what is transdisciplinary, certainly when it comes to Chris, and what is transformational? And I would say that that typifies the way that Chris actually worked. He surrounded himself with, with researchers of world class and an administration that uh, I think most of us would have died to have. And not only did he establish an internal support system, which he led incredibly well because of his own personality, but he also reached out to many international bodies and established what we now call Watch as an international place to go if you want to know about water and specifically sanitation. And I had a working relationship with Chris that goes back to the days when he was working with cleaner production technology and uh, life cycle costing and with Chris Brookert was doing a lot of modeling work. And they were well known for being experts in those fields. And then of course, with the change in politics, Hector Guini was created, the Metro, which I described back in 2000 as the Metro of 3-1 million. A million people with world-class services, could it be New York or London? A million people who had once had world-class services in, in the largely dormitory towns around Durban, where mainly African people live, which had been neglected for 30 years and were in a terrible state. And then a million people who had no municipal services. Their water supply was a well, often polluted, and their toilet was the bush or a pit. And the challenge we faced in Etimuni was bring about transformation make sure that everybody has access to these services. And we started and made lots of mistakes and then realized that we needed a partner um, who we could work with to help us understand and learn lessons from what we were doing. And what was then called PRG, now the WASH Center, um, seemed to be an obvious partner for us. And so the city put in what was in, I think a million is now two and a half or more million a year to actually fund applied research. Um, and I guess the three objectives are what it says there, support innovation and assess the impact. So how are we doing? We have an objective group of researchers who could be trusted to tell us what was going on, to model systems, and I've already mentioned Chris Brookert, and to guide our decisions. And I often remember some of Chris's students getting a bit cross with us because we wanted to apply the research before it had even been published because it was so valuable. But we found a way to work around that. So I'm going to tell you a story about some of the work that we've done together and some of the challenges that we faced, which will make the point as to why we need transdisciplinary research and why it has to be something that brings about change. So the city in the three millions, this, this map typifies it. To the right of that red line that you can see, the snaky red line from coast to coast, this is the metro. They had first world services and everybody to the left had basically no services. And within the first world group were these islands of dense settlements and communities with poor services that we had to address. And the reality is that at that time, the choice you had was between a flush toilet and a pit toilet. Now, I always was interested in the manufacture of the first Victorian toilets was a crockery maker. And you can see it in this toilet. What struck me when I saw this picture the other day was the size of the system for flushing. Can you imagine today having a system that size in an environment where water is scarce, 
and particularly in this country where it is so poorly distributed. Um, and so we had to find something that bridged the gap between that and the pit. And that's where Wash and Chris started to come to the fore. And he left basically the cleanup production and the industry-based research and moved into doing research to enable us to provide services to those that didn't have them. It wasn't only a problem of the toilet. It was also, what do we do with the, what comes out of the toilet? How do we use it in a way or treat it in a way that's affordable and easy to use? And so many initiatives were started. This is the DWATS plant, which Chris and the team did a lot of research into to improve. This is the Women's Mastery Research Center where we were able to test in these different rows, different models of this plant, which uses no energy and is simple to operate and makes sewering of rural and areas away from power a lot easier. But equally, there was the sludge from pits. And here the transdisciplinary nature came in again because we were able to process pit toilet sludges into these fertilizer pellets. But then the question was, can we use them in agriculture? Are they safe? What is the impact of using this and other sludges on agriculture? And so partnerships were built with the agricultural people to, to look into what works best and what is safe and what isn't safe and how good is this as a fertilizer? All of which then led to what now has become a common set of buzzwords, the sanitation circular economy. And if you, if you look at this, at this uh, map, I'll just put on my um, winter. Doesn't seem to want to give me the pointer. Anyway, if you look over here, you see industry, the cleaner production work. If you look in this circle over here, you see all the work relating to toilets and treatment and technology. And here is another circle which we've yet to bring into the play in any real way is the use of electronics and smart technologies. There are sort of the embryos of this and the water research mining data out of sewers to see where COVID is and all the rest of it. But this circular economy thing makes sanitation for all possible. Because if there are business opportunities and revenue sources available to providers of the service, then it becomes something that can be implemented across the world. And so we moved from a Durban-based research partnership to something that started to influence world thinking. And the Toilet Board Coalition and others drew strongly on the work that Chris and the team had done to take this notion of how do we make sanitation services available to everybody to heart and use this kind of thinking to actually drive the move towards sanitation. But of course, in the toilet, in the toilet technology side, we had to move away from having these two options of a pit or a flushing toilet to something else, which has taken up a lot of the research time of, of WASH. And you may wonder, well, why do, we, why do we worry about processing waste? And there are these two graphs which really struck home to me many years ago. The first one shows the amount of farm or arable land per person over time. And you can see that in, in uh, 50 years, the amount of arable land per person is halved, which means we have to feed more people on less land. Now, it's true that part of that is as a result of improvements in agricultural production and efficiencies. But the other problem is that the fertilizer that we use, the phosphorus, for example, isn't unlimited. We worry about oil running out one day and alternative energy. But phosphorus has no, no alternative. As you can see here, uh, in about 2030, in just 10 years' time, we reach the peak of phosphorus mining. Because it's a rock that's mined in, in these countries that you can see across the bottom here. And it's not unlimited. And as the stored amount runs out, the quality goes down. It's polluted with metals and arsenic and other things. And after 2100, there is no more phosphorus rock to mine. And if we don't start recovering it and recycling it, it's all in the bottom of the ocean. And then how do we feed people? And how do we have intensive agriculture? So we're talking about achieving the sustainability of the world. And I think that's what's caught the attention of the world, that this work that we started 15 years ago, a bit more, 20 years ago, is now starting to gain international recognition. 
I'm going to talk briefly about this because Kathy, this is her area of expertise. But a problem we face too is that as South Africa has changed, so the challenge of providing services has changed and the need for new approaches has changed. If you look on the right of the shopping center here, you can see people living in the bush. And on the left here, you can see the start of a shake settlement, which we provided services to. And three years later, if you look at the bottom here, you will see that the people from the bush moved to where the water was. At the same time, the city was starting to develop land here at the top for a township. And we provided water services there. And two years later, if you look at the top, that's what had happened. And now we have that challenge. How do we provide water and sanitation services to those people? And again, the collaboration, the, the transformation that has been necessary and the interdisciplinary research that's gone into this has made this kind of thing possible. And you may think, well, this is just South Africa, but I went and Googled some old towns. Here's one in France. And you can see this, is, this town is hundreds of years old, but you can imagine three, 400 years ago, that also was an informal settlement. We'll go to Medellin in South America, same thing. Those people have services, they have water and sanitation. And we can learn from those countries as well. And, and the collaboration that Chris has built has enabled us to advance the thinking in these areas. So research also can change thinking. I put this up, this is work that Chris Brookwood and I did, um, because the common view at the time was that people that don't pay for water, waste water, that they use far more. And if you look, if I take this 2015 one, and you look, take any volume, the black line are, are poor people, people living in, in, in low, low value houses, the blue are middle income and the red are high income. If you take any consumption, take, or any, take here, 50% of the people at this point, this, the, the, the faint line is the people that are not paying. They are using less water than they're paying customers. In fact, 90% of the people that don't pay for water who are poor actually realize that they, they should be paying and are using less. And then you see that across the customers. And that disproved the theory that, that we had, that if you, if you, if you meet a people and they don't pay, they will waste water. And they don't. And that certainly was a lesson uh, for me to learn. So to end, where does this leave us? Well, I believe that Chris has laid an incredibly solid foundation and started the world thinking on a path that 25 years ago wasn't even on the agenda. And he has built, as I said right at the beginning, a partnership with many people, researchers in agriculture, development studies, chemical and civil engineering, economics. Our tariffs were an issue at one time. Are we charging tariffs for water that are fair to the poor? that are, as Ramsey would call, welfare maximizers. And one of my staff did a master's dissertation for his MBA. And guess who supervised it? Chris. And it proved that our tariff structure was not correct and that we had to change it. And so we were able to make changes, which then affected the lives of 280,000 families. We've worked with the statistics people and with the modelers. And that has resulted in a transformation in our thinking about how we provide water and sanitation to poor people. And as uh, Albert said at the beginning, the collaboration, this work has drawn the collaboration of many institutions, Bill and Melinda Gates, WRC, and many international partners, Ievach and Umea, and the list is very, very long. And so we're at the point, we're not there yet, where affordable, sustainable sanitation solutions for all are now fast becoming a reality. And I wanted to close with one picture. I, I talked at the beginning about the way Chris worked, the way he surrounds himself with people. Chris always seemed to, although he was well known, he, he wanted to push his people forward. And in 2014, and here's the picture, we won, uh, it to really won the Stockholm Industry Award. And I'll give you one guess as to who was a major player behind it. He wasn't there when we received the award and he's not here today. I think that says it all. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Neil, for that very thoughtful and insightful presentation. Uh, if anyone has questions or comments for Neil, please post them in the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we now move on to our second speaker, uh, Kathy Sutherland. Um, Professor Sutherland, while she gets ready, I'll just give her resume, is an urban geographer who specializes in environmental water and climate governments, with a focus on informal settlements and peri-urban areas in Durban. The theory and practice of local environmental change, urban governance, state citizen relations and social transformation, and how these shape urban sustainability in cities in the South are of particular interest in her work. She is an academic in the School of Built Environment and Development Studies at UKZN Durban, and she teaches modules on sustainability, governance and development. And Kathy worked extremely closely with Chris. So Kathy, if you'd like to show yourself, over to you. Can you hear me, um, Sally? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Can we just can't see, see you. And can you see my screen? I can see us, uh, your screen. We can't see you. And you can see me now. Now we can see you. Over to you, okay, Kathy. Thank you so much. It's an absolute honor and privilege to talk to everybody today about transdisciplinary research. Um, around water and sanitation for transformative sustainable development and to reflect on this amazing legacy of Professor Chris Buckley, whom we all worked with very, very closely. In terms of the way in which Chris worked, I think it's really important to look at this slide around thinking about how we deal with water and sanitation. And of course, globally, there's a, a lot of recognition that universal centralized systems are the most important ways in which to provide water and sanitation to all, because they're safe, they provide accessible and dignified sanitation systems. But while Chris worked on these universal centralized systems, and as Neil said, looked at ways of dealing with resource recovery and improving those systems, he also had a strong recognition, as you'll see in the image of Dar es Salaam on the right, that in many cities in the world, the sewage systems or the sanitation systems don't extend to the boundaries of most of these fast growing cities. And so Chris had a very good understanding of the need of the combination of universal centralized systems and then these decentralized water and sanitation systems that had to address the spaces where sanitation systems don't go. He was also concerned about where the sewers go, how access, reliability and quality was different for different groups of people. And so he had a strong interest in the social and environmental costs of both of these forms of systems. Chris was very proud of and loved his city of Durban within which he worked and he lived. And he saw the city as being an amazing laboratory as we all do of understanding many of the challenges that face both the global South and the global North around water and sanitation. And if you look at the story of Etiqueni, which Neil has referred to as well, you'll see that the sewer network of our city essentially mirrors the apartheid city of the old Durban. And Chris was very concerned about these peripheral areas that had been added to the city's boundaries in the year 2000 under the national demarcation process, where there was really unserved areas that needed sanitation services provided post 2000 when this became the responsibility of Etiquini Water and Sanitation. He was also concerned about the quarter of Durban's population who live in informal settlements. And while they're within the sanitation network, because of their space of informality, they don't connect necessarily into the sewer network and hence are not provided with adequate sanitation services. So for Chris, this amazing city with its diverse landscapes, its dual governance and its high, high levels of inequality was a very important space within which to, to deal with the research questions that were so important to him. And of course, he understood these settlements very well. So I've got three examples of where the urban poor live in Etiquini, in informal settlements, low-cost housing projects, and in the peri-urban areas of the city that lack development because these used to fall under the homeland of KwaZulu. And Chris had a very good understanding of the range of sanitation services that emerged or were provided by the state in these different settlement types. And so he worked very hard to try and understand from a, a perspective of interventions, what would be the best intervention to try and provide at least a basic level of sanitation and water for all. And so Chris had a very strong focus on the right to water and sanitation, which is not only a global right, 
but is enshrined in the South African constitution. But while he focused on the right to water and sanitation, and as an engineer did that so extremely well, he also had this amazing ability to see across other disciplines and other needs. And so in his work on the right to sanitation, he also focused on people's right to the city, as Henry Lefebvre talked about, where people tried to gain not only access to land in the city, but the right to participate in the city, the right to a healthy environment, the right to human health, and of course, our commitment to the sustainable development goals. So Chris's work on dealing with water and sanitation transversed across all these other very important rights and goals. While the national government was focusing on addressing poverty and inequality through the provision of low cost houses at scale since 1994, Chris, which was then working with PRG and which later became the WASH R&D Center and EWS formed a very strong partnership as Neil spoke about. And Chris worked very hard on addressing these sanitation deficits, working on how to do resource recovery or the provision of safe sanitation through the communal ablution blocks, which are common across our city in the 566 informal settlements that are located across the landscape of Durban. But his really important work was around the development of urine diversion dehydration toilets that were really a response to a need of a lack of sanitation in the rural periphery and how to address that issue of no sanitation very quickly and as safely as possible. And so 88,000 of these urine diversion toilets were rolled out across the landscape in what covers 43% of the municipal area. And Chris always remained focused on how one could look at these UDTs over time. So he, he was part of the initiative to develop the system across the city. But once developed, he never rested and thought, this is a system that's been rolled out now and, and people can use it. And that's where, where we sit with it. He continually asked questions and we engaged in a lot of research with him around the shelf life of the system, whether it was socially acceptable, how to improve the urine diversion toilets. So if we look at Chris Buckley's approach, and I've given some background to the context within, he worked, within which he worked, I think the key things about Chris was that he was a strategic in addressing, as I said, both the right to water and sanitation and other rights and goals, social, environmental, and economic. Chris was an incredible leader. He always led from above and below. And why I say that is that Chris was able to stand up as a leader when it was really required and to take that leadership role and to very strongly and firmly insist on safe and dignified sanitation for all. But he also recognized that leadership comes from below. It comes from building people up from the bottom. So a really good leader is someone who is able to build the capacity and empower people so that other leaders build from below and, and rise up above that leader. He was also innovative and experimental. And while innovation and experimentation involves risks, Chris was incredibly meticulous, rigorous, rigorous and evidence-based in his work. And this always, impressed me because no matter how much we were talking about experimentation, Chris always brought us back to the rigor and the importance of fundamental science and doing things correctly. He listened to and respect to all forms of knowledge. So he worked horizontally across networks, co-producing knowledge with multiple actors and then having huge respect for local knowledge, which influenced his work. And as Neil said, he was a relationship-based person. He built interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary networks that have created an incredible platform for all of us and his students who he's, he invested so much time in to continue with his legacy. So if we look at what his legacy is about, Chris in the post-apartheid era focused very much on addressing, as I said, this challenge of a lack of services in the, in the periphery of the city. He believed in providing basic services for all rather than trying to do the spatial incrementation of service provision going outwards, because he understood and the cholera outbreak also raised that question for him, that if you spatially try to distribute services going outwards, many people would be without services for a very long time. He built these strong university state research partnerships with UKZN, EWS and WRC, and he believed in community engagement. And as a result of that, we saw some important interventions in our city, as, as I've mentioned, the UDTs, Chris, uh, Neil spoke about the free basic water policy and also the communal ablution blocks, which are very well known for their ability to try and assist informal settlement residents in accessing some form of sanitation. But as time went on, Chris started to reflect more on the 
on the principles of sustainable sanitation from this integrated way of looking at social, economic and environmental challenges. And so we started to see his work drawing on this amazing knowledge and understanding and insight he had around social technical interventions, around the importance of the environment and the circular economy. He started to embrace this idea of decentralized systems to supplement centralized systems, where either centralized systems were not serving everyone or where there were no sanitation systems. And so his work on non sewered sanitation systems is renowned. And of course, in the last few years, he really started to embrace and engage the work of transdisciplinarity. And he established the engineering field testing platform, which all of us have been privileged to be a part of. And over the last five years, I think my learning in that engineering field testing platform has been probably one of my most exceptional learning experiences I've had. He was able to draw in funding from the Belinda, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to support this innovative platform and also support from important national agents like the Water Research Commission. And so when Chris left us, he had left us with a set of partnerships that involved the university, state, private sector actors, and community research partnerships. And that's the legacy we now build on. As I said, Chris really began to embrace, I'd say five years ago, this idea of transdisciplinary research. And through Chris's work and my engagement with him, we adapted the, the model created by Paul et al. in Switzerland around transdisciplinary research. Because in the South African case or in the South or in the work that we do in the WASH R&D Center, we see transdisciplinary research as science and society working together to address sustainability issues. And the realm of science is fundamentally embedded in the way in which society responds to problems. The way that we frame problems, we co-produce data, we analyze problems together and we understand the impact. And in this engineering wash, um, wash, sorry, the wash R&D engineering field testing platform, and you can see all the actors involved in it, we really started to experiment around how we actually apply transdisciplinary research to, to achieve the, the outcomes in water and sanitation that we also desire. And so I'm going to talk to two examples that we worked on together, the testing of the Airvog hand washing station and the Luwa toilets as they reflect Chris's legacy. So this is the Airvog hand washing station. It's a hand hygiene system that was put into an informal settlement, Quarry Road West informal settlement in 2019. And this was an amazing testing of this innovative system, which worked extremely well. And what we discovered is that this hand washing station became a niche intervention because in dealing with community members that were using it and using community-based researchers, we started to understand how communities interfaced with this beautiful um, system that EOS had actually designed and with simple elements added to it, like a mirror and a roof to protect people from the rain. In fact, the communities called this the ATM because it reminded them of an ATM. But our social research showed how this hand washing station, which is a recycled hand washing station developed by Earvag, actually supplemented the hand washing systems that were already available within the informal settlement community and became an, an additional and value added sanitation, water and sanitation system that really enhanced the quality of life of people living there. And most importantly, what we learned from this research was why transdisciplinarity in our research approaches is so important. So through the engineering field testing platform, the funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and through all the partners that worked on this project, we developed a transdisciplinary system of knowledge exchange that um, Eva and myself and others in the team have written about. But what you'll see that's so important in this diagram is that the community is central to the testing of this hygiene, uh, hand washing station innovation. So you've got social scientists from Eervag and UKZN, engineering scientists from Eervag and UKZN working together very closely with community researchers, supported by Kanisa projects and Etikwini municipality and the politicians. But essentially the knowledge flows and the importance of testing this technology sits and, and, and finds its heart in the community. And that's where we mo learned most of the lessons about how this um, technology could actually function in the real world. The same was true with the testing of the Luwat, Luwat toilets in informal settlements in Durban. And here we were trying to test an, an established technology, which is used a lot in the Philippines and Madagascar, to see if it could meet the needs of informal settlement residents in our city. And so we, need to see, we needed to see if this was a good technical and social solution for the lack of sanitation services in informal settlements. Was it commercially viable? 
Was it financially sustainable and what were the risk factors? And while we were doing this research, and I spoke to Chris a lot about this in the last six months of his life, it reminded me of the way in which Chris always asked the most important questions. He always inspired us and pushed us to ask questions of, um, that reflected his understanding, his knowledge, his integrity, the responsibility he took towards testing these new sanitation technologies and the insight he showed. And of course, we always had in our minds that no matter what technology we were testing, we always had to think of possibilities for res resource recovery to try and full, uh, close the full cycle of the sanitation service. And so again, when we tested the Luwat toilet, as you can see, the informal household and informal settlements were the center of that testing process. And through the social science research that we did, we discovered many important points about how informal settlement residents respond to sanitation technologies, their relationship with the municipality and how services legitimize their position in the city as informal residents. We learned from them about the social acceptability of toilets and what's important to them for a dignified and accessible and safe form of sanitation their need for alternative sanitation services, and of course the structures that they would request in terms of housing these kinds of toilets. And interestingly, most people wanted them outside their households. We learned about their willingness to pay for services and also their concern about the safe removal and their understanding and, and willingness to want to know about the engineering practices of this particular toilet so that it could be implemented safely. And so what we learned from the Luwat intervention was that in fact, what was starting to emerge was that the Luwat wouldn't replace the communal ablution blocks, but in fact, it would, was something that could be complementary to the universal large scale state provided services that were rolled out. And that they were willing to privately pay for these toilets so that in combination, they could have clean, safe, accessible and dignified sanitation. And so it leads me to my last points about, I think the legacy that Chris has really left us with and some important questions that through the work that we've done with him with many years have started to appear in my mind. And of course, I think most of you will know, not being in the field of water and sanitation, the well-established thinking around the ladder of sanitation, that people will hopefully move from very poor sanitation systems, such as open defecation, up the ladder of sanitation to safely managed um, sanitation systems, which are largely on centralized systems, and I guess, in most people's mind, flush toilets. So this ladder of sanitation is well established. It's in the SDGs, it's in the national government um, policies. And on the right-hand side, I've got the ladder of sanitation that Chris was really working on, which was moving up to much more safe, accessible and dignified sanitation systems, but also, also ones that were environmentally and socially acceptable in, in addressing the reduction and reuse and recycling elements of sanitation. So this concept of a ladder of sanitation services is very much embedded in the discourse of water and sanitation. But in our work in Durban and in my work with Chris, I started to question this idea of what really in a sense is a linear way of getting people to think about moving up this ladder to finally reaching the highest level of sanitation provision. And of course, in reality, we don't find that that is the case. In our city of Durban, and I think elsewhere in the world, what we discover is that rather than having a ladder of sanitation, we have these multiple forms of sanitation that work together in a circle to try and address the multiple sanitation challenges and the inequalities in cities. And so all of the sanitation systems that we've talked about today are sitting in the circle and they're used in different ways in different spaces and often in combination to address the services of sanitation in the city. So it's left me wondering about this concept of a ladder of sanitation with people, officials, communities, national governments, thinking that everybody's gonna move up this ladder when in fact, that's not what's playing out. That we're rather seeing a combination or a circle or um, these loops between different forms of sanitation. And Chris understood that better than anyone. He understood all of the challenges facing water and sanitation, rapid urbanization, densification, water scarcity, costs, social mobilization and politics of services, aspirations and equality and big questions about what citywide inclusive sanitation look like. And he left us with these very important ideas. And of course, as though they're presented as binaries or dualisms, because I'm talking about one thing or another, that's not the point I want to make. Chris never believed in binaries or dualisms. He was always looking on continuums, always looking across things to try and find solutions. 
And what he's left us with is an idea around sanitation, about both centralized and decentralized sanitation systems <coughs> and how these can work together. The thoughts about whether we focus on a ladder where everyone has the ex expectation to move up, but is perhaps disappointed because they never reach the top of the ladder and rather a, a safe and well-developed circle of sanitation services that support people and provide them with safe and accessible and dignified sanitation. Chris always, and, and just in his character, he was someone who had to go fast, but understood that in going fast and addressing these urgent challenges, you also had to go slow and think carefully and do things properly. You need to be innovative, but at the same time, extremely rigorous because you're dealing with people's health and the environmental health when you're dealing with water and sanitation. Of course, to focus on the green economy and issues around sustainability and protecting our planet, but always doing that in the safest way possible. And his important and very, very um, influential work on the relationship between state and the citizens and how the state interfaces with citizens to try and address societal needs. And of course, raising questions of what role the private sector has to play. And of course, global funders as well. But perhaps the most important thing that Chris left us with, with this year was his incredible effort and his unbelievable um, insight to develop a space of co-production of knowledge and transdisciplinary research that has now become a platform that we're all going to grow our future research on and to build on his legacy. So he had an amazing understanding of what citywide inclusive sanitation means, what it means to people, what it means to technology, to the state, to particular contexts with their histories and geographies and how to scale up these ideas to provide sanitation for all. And so I think through Chris's life and his legacy, we have learned that water and sanitation interventions are transformative and can lead to broader societal change, not just in terms of providing water and sanitation to people, but by, meeting, by addressing important human rights, by building state citizen compacts, by building social cohesion, and Chris was a master at doing this through his unbelievable ability to build relationships with people and for, by ensuring that there's dignity for all. Thank you, Sally. Thanks very much, um, Kathy. Uh, I think Chris would be, would think that was a good shout out and a good show. Uh, we have a, a few minutes for questions before uh, we close the session. I just want to kick off a question on my side. I mean, when I think of Chris, I think of his transdisciplinary nature and, and managing to pull everyone in. And uh, you, are, you are a prime example coming from the College of Humanities while we're sitting here in uh, the College of AES. And what was it about Chris that managed to make people work together and do transdisciplinary research? I think in answering that question, I think Chris's ability to build relationships with people through, through the way in which he, he understood all forms of knowledge mattered. And so it's very rare often in, in particular fields of knowledge to come across somebody who really embraces and understands the construction of knowledge in different forms, different epistemologies and ontologies of knowledge. And Chris, although he was an amazing and incredible engineer, he had the ability to really understand um, different ways in which knowledge was constructed. And that's not only academic knowledge. Um, Chris was really, really good at engaging people on the ground and learning from them and, and understanding that local knowledge or tacit knowledge is, is as valuable often as scientific knowledge in, in solving problems. And so his ability to understand different forms of knowledge and to respect different forms of knowledge was the starting point. Because of that, he then could build relationships with people because he was able to listen very well. So although he had so many ideas, I always think back to the way in which he used to work together and we'd all be talking madly and Chris would be sitting listening. And then he'd stand up on the whiteboard, take out his pen and just create these incredible diagrams that summed up everybody's ideas from different forms of knowledge, giving equal weighting to all these different forms of knowledge and then being able to pull, pull that together. And so I think perhaps sadly the most important thing that Chris had that enabled him to build these transdisciplinary relationships, uh, sorry, transdisciplinary networks and relationships was respect and humility and being able to listen to others and then to transfer what others had said back into a framing that pulled everybody together. 
So in that way, he really was a very, very special person. And of course, just his kindness and his ability to support and, and build young people up, which also drew young thinkers who had these new ideas into the space of research. And I know many of my young researchers and some of my other researchers always said that Chris had this amazing ability to, to make them believe in themselves. And so I suppose he made people believe in their knowledge and gave them built trust so that they could share knowledge together. So these were very special characteristics that enabled him to really drive transdisciplinary research in the university and globally. Uh, thanks for summing up, I think, what is the essence of Chris. Um, I'm going to, there are a couple of more technical questions here. Um, and Neil, feel free to jump in if you can answer this. So Albert Modi was asking, um, any work on modeling of water and energy for sanitation? What are the important variables and how do you in influence them safely and sustainably? Neil, do you think you could answer that? Yeah, so, I mean, I didn't talk about the nexus, but there is this other set of interdependencies between water, food, and energy. Um, and even in Etiagwini, and, and in South Africa through the Water Research Commission and others, there have been there has been modeling work done on how do we use the residual energy and water pipe networks to generate electricity. When, when the dam on the, on the Mkumazi River eventually gets built, there's actually a place up near Hillcrest to build a 10 megawatt hydro power station because the water comes from that tall TV mast up near Alveston down into Durban. And rather than burning the energy using pressure reducing valves, heat and noise, put it through a, through a turbine and make a lot of electricity. Um, and so the modeling links closely to the pattern of flow in the, in the pipes. And usually water is in demand when electricity is in demand. You wash or you cook together. So, so there's a lot of potential, but it's more about synchronizing the two in, in, in the municipal sphere. Um, and it's something to come. That it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a common thing at the moment, but I think uh, yeah, Albert is right. It's, it's something that will occupy the minds of, of the next generation of researchers. Um, at the moment, we're just trying to make sure that everybody has water and, and a toilet and sanitation. That leads to the next question by Albert is, what is your views on waterless toilets? So that is what we are aiming for. Because here's the, the silliness of flushing toilets. An average person produces a liter of excrement a day. And typically we go to the toilet four times a day. So about 40 liters of pure purified water is added to your one liter of waste. That water has to be treated and brought to your house and then transported all the way back to a sewage works to treat effectively one, one in every 40 liters to remove the solids and the, and the bacteria. It just doesn't make sense. So we've been working, and, and this is maybe why we haven't solved the problem for 150 years since Victoria's toilet, Queen Victoria's toilet. The, the aim is to find surface coatings that will enable us to have waterless toilets. The EOS toilet, which has been a result of collaboration between Chris's team and, and the Swiss, uh, uses only 0.6 of a litre to flush. We want to get it to zero and have something like a Teflon coating, but not Teflon, something that our urine and waste at a molecular level doesn't stick to. We've looked at surface texturing and research in that area, but uh, we're, we're not there yet, but we're hitting there. 0.6 is a big improvement from the old 20 litres, and that one you saw in the pictures are 25 litres, down to nine, down to six, now we're down to 0.6. So yes, we've got to get to the point. And if we can do that, then everybody can have the same toilet. Um, and it makes the treatment of the solids a lot easier because you've got a lot less water. And you could have a, a, something like a washing machine size device at the back of your house that recovers the nutrients and the energy and just sends the bath water and the kitchen water to the sewage rooms, which changes the sewer network. You're talking about a revolution equivalent to the cell phone revolution and telephony. That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Huge changes in the way that we think and behave and design cities. But now you want um, to give a lecture on technology. I'll stop there. I think, and I think what Neil's saying is so important and what, 
what Chris enabled through his through his work and through the development of the engineering field testing platform is that many of the things that Neil's talking about, we've been testing in households in Durban over the last five years. And so we've been working with Cranfield, with EOS, with Earbag, yeah. with um, Duke, with um, USF, Hel so many Hel different Hel technology developers. And we've learned so much about how much water is, is possible um, in a toilet. And in terms of social acceptability, we've learned that you probably still need some water. As Neil said, we're getting right down to the, the smallest amounts of water, but for the reasons and the ways in which people respond to toilet systems, um, we still haven't really cracked the issue of no water at all in toilets. But having said that, the Luwat toilet that we've been testing um, in informal settlements, as I showed in my presentation, that is a waterless toilet. So it's a toilet that, in a sense, in, in responding to real sanitation pressures, needs certain levels of need. So we are learning a lot in our city, and we really hope to continue to do the work that we're doing, because across all of these technologies that we've tested, and in fact, the Gates Foundation is also in their second phase, started to combine different, four, different elements of these different toilets we've tested. So I think we're really moving into an era of and Chris would have loved this, I think, of continuums and combinations and fractals, because it's not just a one thing or another thing. It's actually combinations. And that's where we're really going to find the answers. And so I think he really was an amazing thinker because he kind of had the vision of that long before any of us actually saw it. And through the platform that he created, we're now actually physically testing these toilets. In fact, two of my researchers are doing the social assessment on the new GRT toilet this evening and understanding how people respond to them. And through that testing and, and learning together, I think, and through these combinations, I'm sure we're gonna to get to a much better system of sanitation in the future for all, which is what Chris would have wanted. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, we're almost out of time. So I think I'll just ask Neil, if you want to make any final comments to add to what Kathy has, has had to say. Yeah, I think Kathy's done a great job in summarizing Chris. The thought that came to me is Chris was an unusual engineer. Um, the only engineering that I saw in him besides his technical expertise was that he was demanding of himself and of the people around him. You know, he, he was driven to, to achieve success, but in a generally in a quiet way. Um, and his communication skills as everybody, had, or as you heard, was, were amazing. Um, he was personable, he was a good communicator, he was a, he was a good and a strong leader, um, he was respected across the world. The, the places I went to, if I mentioned PRGs, it was or Wash and Chris, everybody knew, oh yes, we know what you're up to. So that, that center is, is a world player. So I think that in itself was a tribute to, to Chris's work. And, I, and as, as I also said at the end of my talk, I think Chris's behind the scenes work will have an impact for many years to come. He started us on a course and on a way of thinking um, and new ideas that will drive research and innovation for many years to come. So yeah, a special person has left us. Thanks very much, Neil. Uh, we've come to the end of our time. So thank you to both Neil and Kathy for capturing the essence of Chris the person and the work that he did. And to Prof Modi for welcoming us and to the audience for for being here to listen and share our memories of Chris and his transdisciplinary research. That brings us to the end of this session. Uh, we will now break away into the flash presentations. Uh, to get the link, you go to the website and uh, the Pris website and click on the particular link. And please join us again at three o'clock for the prize giving and for the lucky draw prizes. It might just be your lucky day. So thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.